Oh, hello! I didn't see you there. I'm Tad Larkin, the resident Mandalorian historian. Throughout the 37-odd years of its existence, the authors and content creators of the Star Wars Expanded Universe have sculpted many spectacular stories that have captivated Star Wars fans generations apart when the films just weren't enough. Tonight, I will be listing the top 10 of my favorite pieces from this elegant reading from a more civilized age. Starting off at number 10 is Matthew Stover's Shatterpoint, published in 2003. Taking place around six months after the Battle of Geonosis, Shatterpoint follows Mace Windu on his journey to his homeworld of Harun Kal to investigate the disappearance of his former Padawan, Deba Balaba, and bring about an end to a brutal civil war between two factions, one Republic allied and the other Separatist allied. I enjoy Shatterpoint because this is one of the very few times we get a Mace Windu-focused story. Sure, he had some of his own comics and is a prevalent figure in many of the comics and novels of the prequel era, but this is the first time he gets his own novel-length story from his and only his perspective. Each chapter starts off with one of his own journal entries, and through these journal entries, we get more of an insight into his views on the Clone War and what was happening within the Jedi Order, and even his views on the Force. We also gain more insight into his unique Jedi ability, which is the ability to see shatter points in the Force. He describes them as rifts in the Force surrounding very prominent beings or objects that have an immense effect on the outcome of events. For an example, in the first chapter, he explains that Chancellor Palpatine is a truly massive shatter point that all other shatter points paled in comparison to, and he guessed correctly that the fate of the galaxy itself hinged on the life of this one being. Though he could see these shatter points, evidently it was up to his interpretation whether to protect them or shatter them. Mace Windu is just an overall interesting character, because he can go from calm, serene, and sagely to a determined warrior in the blink of an eye, and he even developed his own unique lightsaber combat style, Vapad, that requires the wielder to skirt the edge of the dark side to access powerful blows and precision strikes. If you like Mace Windu, I highly recommend this book. Sliding in at number 9 is Dark Force Rising by Timothy Zahn. Dark Force Rising is the second book in the Thrawn trilogy, published in 1992. Picking up from where Heir to the Empire left off, Dark Force Rising follows our galactic heroes from the films as they try to stop Grand Admiral Thrawn from destroying the New Republic. While Leia Organa Solo tries to convince the Nogri on Honiger to defect from the Empire, Han Solo and Lando Calrissian learn about a mysterious fleet of dreadnoughts called the Dark Force that disappeared in the days of the Old Republic, and they seek to find them for the New Republic before Thrawn can get his hands on them and use them against them. I love the Thrawn trilogy as a whole, but forcing myself to pick only one book from that series to put on my top 10 list, it has to be Dark Force Rising simply because, at this point in the story, the war between the New Republic and the Imperial Remnant united under Thrawn is ramping up, and we get some serious heated exchanges between these two galactic powers. In Heir to the Empire, the New Republic was in chaos, as this mysterious Imperial warlord began making hit-and-run attacks on settlements and causing massive destruction. Now, it's escalated to where the New Republic knows who and what they're dealing with, and they're fighting back. Not only do we get some great conflict in this novel, but we also get to explore a new alien race, the Nogri from Honiger. And through Leia's discoveries, we discover ourselves how this warrior society was duped by the Empire into serving them, and their reverence for Leia's paternal father, Darth Vader. On that note, we also get to see some of the fallout from Luke and Leia's relationship with Vader, and how the sins of their father reflect on them as they try to save the galaxy. Leia more so than Luke in this novel. Again, I recommend the Thrawn trilogy in its entirety to anyone who wishes to continue Luke, Leia, Han, Chewie, and Gang's adventures in the post-Endor galaxy. I'm just saying that Dark Force Rising is my personal favorite out of the three. At number 8, we have Legacy of the Force, Sacrifice, by Karen Travis. I'm quite aware of the controversy surrounding this novel and how divisive it is within the Expanded Universe fan community. However, that doesn't stop me from enjoying it. Published in 2007 as the fifth book,
book in the Legacy of the Force series, Sacrifice continues the ongoing escalation of the Second Galactic Civil War between the Galactic Alliance and the Corellian Confederation, and Jason Solo's fall to the dark side as he's pushed further by his mentor, the Dark Lady of the Sith, Lumaya. A great many fans were upset with this novel when it came out, due to the unforeseen death of a beloved character. And needless to say, spoiler warnings from here on out. Mara Jade's death at the hands of her nephew in the novel was a decision that didn't sit right with many fans, and even some of the other Star Wars authors. And while I sympathize and understand why they were upset, it never really bothered me, and I thought the author gave her a good send-off. Though many will probably disagree, and that's perfectly okay. But the reason why I like Sacrifice was never about the main storyline that followed the Solo and Skywalker families. In fact, the entire reason why I read the Legacy of the Force series in the first place wasn't for them at all. It was so I could get some closure with another Star Wars novel series that was sadly never finished. Apart from following the Solos and the Skywalkers, the Legacy of the Force series also follows Boba Fett, as he tries to find a cure for his degrading health, track down his daughter, Sintas Vel, and finds an unlikely companion in his estranged granddaughter, Myrta Gave. As I've said in my Top 10 Expanded Universe Characters video, the reason why I love Sacrifice is because I love the dynamic between Boba Fett and Myrta Gev, and I enjoyed watching their relationship evolve from a vengeful granddaughter trying to kill her grandfather for walking out on her mom and grandma in Legacy of the Force Bloodlines, to a buddy cop dynamic with a grizzled veteran paired up with a snarky but knowledgeable newcomer in Legacy of the Force Sacrifice. I also love Sacrifice because, true to any Karen Travis Star Wars novel, it's packed with juicy Mandalorian lore that a nerd like me can't get enough of. In Sacrifice specifically, we get to see how Mandalorian politics work, how Mandalorians forge Beskar weaponry, and their ingenuity creating new weapons and warcrafts. Not to mention, we meet a few new Mandalorian characters along the way. But what I really value the book for is we finally get some answers to the questions that we're left with in the Republic Commando novel series, which you'll be hearing about later. Karen Travis never got to finish her follow-up series to Republic Commando titled Imperial Commando, due to Lucas licensing requiring her to go back and rewrite all of her previous books to fit in with the 2008 Clone Wars series which basically ignored all the books, comics, and video games that came out before it. She resigned from the franchise after basically being intellectually boxed in. Luckily, the three novels she wrote for Legacy of the Force, which was finished before she left the franchise, contained characters from the previous Republic Commando series, which took place some 60 years before Legacy of the Force, that give insight as to what happened after those events, and answered some of the most important questions from that series. I suppose my main point is, yes, Legacy of the Force sacrifice is controversial, but I love it for the subplots, not the main one. Coming in at number 7 is Darth Plagueis by James Lucino. Did you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? From the moment Chancellor Palpatine uttered those infamous words in Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, that are still endlessly echoed in internet memes, Star Wars fans had wondered, just who is Darth Plagueis? And in 2012, James Lucino answered our questions. Darth Plagueis spans roughly, don't quote me, 80 years, and follows a mune banker named Hago Damas, whose alter ego is the Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Plagueis. From killing his master, Darth Tenebrous, and usurping the title, to recruiting his own Sith apprentice, Darth Sidious, in the events that lead up to his own ascension. Star Wars Darth Plagueis is fantastic because we get to see all of the behind-the-scenes scheming that led to the downfall of the Galactic Republic in the years leading up to the Battle of Naboo, and we gain insight into what was going through the minds of Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious as they plotted for galactic domination. Sidious's origins are also heavily explored, and we get to see him as a promising young university student, and watch as he's taken under Damask's wing and corrupted by the ruinous powers of the dark side of the Force, and the atrocities he commits in its name. My only gripe with the novel, as some can probably guess, is that, like most post-2008 Star Wars media, it's affected by the Star Wars The Clone Wars television series, that really mucked about with the continuity in a way that left the expanded universe severely damaged before its decanonization.
Despite this perceived hiccup in the momentum of the story, the event is rarely referenced again throughout the novel, and we get the added bonus of seeing Darth Maul's early life as Sidious's apprentice, and the semantics of Sidious convincing Plagueis, who's still alive at this point, that he's only training him as a Sith assassin. Arguably, the most important thing we get from this novel, however, is an explanation for Anakin's conception, which, at this point, makes the reader feel as if all of the pieces of a great puzzle are finally falling into place. The other interesting thing about this novel is that there's a surprising amount of input from George Lucas, who Lucino corresponded with, and it was actually George's idea that Plagueis himself wasn't human, and together, they settled on him being immune from Munilinst. Star Wars Darth Plagueis is an extraordinary novel, and I highly recommend it to people like me who like to dive deeper to uncover interesting, albeit extraneous, information about the astropolitical nature of the galaxy at the time of the Star Wars prequel trilogy. Number 6 in my top 10 novel list is Outbound Flight by Timothy Zahn. Published in 2006, Outbound Flight is Timothy Zahn's prequel to his Thrawn trilogy, his Hand of Thrawn duology, and Star Wars Survivor's Quest. Taking place five years after Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, Outbound Flight follows a band of smugglers who flee to the unknown regions from a hut crime lord, and an ambitious project led by the Jedi to explore the unknown regions of the galaxy, and eventually a nearby satellite galaxy. However, forces await in the unknown regions that can be hazardous to wary travelers. Being a prequel to basically all of Zahn's earlier works in the post-Endor period, Outbound Flight feels like the bow that ties all of his works together in one amazing package. In the novel, Thrawn's origins are explored, and we get to learn more about the Chiss and the Chiss Ascendancy, and their relationship with other civilizations in the mysterious unknown regions of the galaxy. Thrawn isn't the only classic Zahn character to make an appearance in Outbound Flight, as we also see the original Joris Sabayoth before he's a crazy clone, and Georges Cardas, Talon Card's mentor. What's really great about Outbound Flight, though, is that it beautifully ties in with the Star Wars prequel trilogy and all of the EU media that's associated with that era, and even rectifies some of the mistakes made in Zahn's earlier works before it was known what the prequel films would be about. We also get to see some really interesting extrapolation on the early Yuuzhan Vong scouts, and Thrawn's fear of an impending invasion from which the galaxy cannot recover, eventually relaying this information to Sidious and laying the early groundwork for the Empire of the Hand. I highly recommend Outbound Flight to not just Grand Admiral Thrawn fans, but also anyone who's a fan of post-Endor media and is interested in seeing it enmeshed with the prequel era for a sense of a larger interconnected galaxy. Rising to number 5 is Star Wars Darth Bane Path of Destruction by Drew Karpishan. You have to believe me when I say that this was no easy decision, as the entirety of the Darth Bane trilogy is pure gold in my opinion. However, seeing as I could only pick one novel from this brilliant trilogy, nothing beats the first one. I feel this is a bit unfair, because Zana is an interesting character in her own right, and I don't want to detract how awesome she is by picking Path of Destruction over Rule of Two or Dynasty of Evil, but I'm just drawn to Path of Destruction. Taking place 1,000 years before A New Hope, Star Wars Darth Bane Path of Destruction was published in 2006, and follows Dessel, a down-on-his-luck Cortosis miner from Apotros, as his life unexpectedly changes and he joins the Sith army. However, the Dark Lords take notice of his latent Force talents, and he's given the opportunity of a lifetime to join the Brotherhood of the Sith. What I love most about Path of Destruction is that, in essence, it's an underdog story. A kid is born on a backwater world in the Outer Rim, mom dies in childbirth, is mercilessly beaten by his father throughout his childhood, then is forced to take on his deceased father's debts to a greedy mining company that puts its own workers into crippling debt to ensure they work for them indefinitely. Even when he makes it off of his dung hole of a homeworld, he faces a host of new challenges, like his incompetent company commander in the Sith army, and eventually the Brotherhood of Darkness, who is out of touch with what it means to be Sith and to control the dark side. Bane rises above all of this. I sort of identify with Bane in a way, because in high school, I was that quiet kid in the corner reading books, and Bane spent a lot of his time at the Sith Academy 
reading about the Force powers of the ancient Sith Lords in the Archives, when all of the other students were too focused on perfecting their lightsaber techniques. I also love how the book connects with Knights of the Old Republic, as Bane travels to Rakata Prime and recovers the holocron of Darth Revan, where he learns more about what it means to be Sith, as well as a powerful ritual that he utilizes to his own machinations. Another thing that I appreciate is that throughout the early chapters of the book, Dessel's connection to the Force manifests itself in subtle ways. Like, he knows he can predict outcomes of events, so he uses it to win big money gambling and it saves his life multiple times, in scraps with other miners, as well as on the battlefields of the new Sith Wars. To reiterate, the entire Bane trilogy is excellent, and I view it as one big story, and it's hard for me to compartmentalize it into its core trio of books. So please, if you're thinking about reading Path of Destruction, don't stop there. Continue on to the other two books. It's just on this list because I can only choose one. Flying in at number 4 is Star Wars Millennium Falcon by James Lucino. If you can't already tell by now, James Lucino is probably my favorite Star Wars Expanded Universe author, and for good reason too, because I love his attention to detail, his amazing descriptiveness, and his inclusion of little nods to some of my favorite events from other comics and novels done in a way that reinforces the notion that this is all one big interconnected universe. None of his novels exemplifies this more, in my opinion, than Star Wars Millennium Falcon, published in 2008. The main plot for Millennium Falcon takes place shortly after the Second Galactic Civil War. As Han and Leia are caring for their granddaughter Alana, they discover a device on the Falcon that Han had never seen before, which prompts them to try to track down all of the original owners of the Falcon to see what this device was and who installed it. Through the subplot and flashbacks, we follow the Falcon from her construction in the Corellian Engineering Corporation's orbital shipyards 60 years before the Battle of Yavin, to her service for a secret organization of Republic Senators unhappy with Palpatine's administration, and we learn about all of her owners before and after her service with the Republic Group. I find this novel fantastic because, like with number 6, it's kind of this bow that just ties everything together in an awesome little package, and it contracts this expanse of history into just one novel. I especially love the scene where the Falcon, at this point her name is the Stellar Envoy, and her crew navigate the Battle of Coruscant to get to the surface, and it ends up connecting with a little easter egg in Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith, where you can see the Millennium Falcon docking at the Senate spaceport just as Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Palpatine are arriving. Not to mention, one of my favorite aspects of Star Wars is the starships, of course, and it's really cool to see the full history of one so iconic as the Millennium Falcon and we get a full roster of what features were added and taken off of her over the years by different owners. Another unique aspect of this novel that I haven't seen in many other Star Wars novels is that one of the characters that owned the Falcon back when she was the Stellar Envoy ends up in a coma for 60 years, and when he wakes up, we get to see the post-Endor legacy era through his prequel era point of view, and it's kind of hilarious. All in all, Millennium Falcon is an excellent read for anyone who wants to know more about the history of the ship, and there are some facts in there about her that surprised even me. Infiltrating its way to number 3 is Star Wars Republic Commando Triple Zero by Karen Travis. Published in 2005, Triple Zero is the second installment in the Republic Commando series, a companion novel series to the fan-favorite Republic Commando video game. Triple Zero continues to follow the four-man commando team of Omega Squad as they navigate being clone soldiers during the Clone Wars, and in this novel, they're tasked with taking out a Separatist-funded terrorist cell that has shacked up in the heart of the Republic itself, Coruscant. After being reunited with their former training sergeant, Cal Scarada, things get a bit more difficult for Omega Squad, when they're forced to not only work with the recalcitrant Null-class Advanced Recon Clone Commandos, but also a rival training sergeant, Wallen Vow, and one of his top commando teams, Delta Squad. Now, anyone who knows me knows that the Republic Commando series was kind of my nexus for delving deeper into the Star Wars Expanded Universe, and specifically the lore surrounding the Mandalorians. So, if I have to pick one and only one book out of this series, I'm going with Triple Zero. I don't really even know where to begin, because there's just so much I love about this book. 
from the relationships of the clones and how they view each other being from different schools of training, to the juicy tidbits of Mandalorian lore that shaped my fascination with the Mandalorians and ultimately inspired me to make my own set of armor. There's just so much. I suppose we could start with the fact that Delta Squad becomes an aspect of focus for the story, where, in the first Republic Commando novel, Hard Contact, the story mainly only followed Omega Squad. So now we have these major characters from the video game, and we get to see what Boss, Scorch, Fixer, and Sev were up to between their mission to the RAS Prosecutor and their mission to Kashyyyk. We also get our first appearance of Cal Scarata and Wallen Vau, who were only mentioned in the video game's loading screens and Hard Contact. But now, we actually get to learn about them, who they are, how they became Koi Valdar, and their relationships with their clone trainees. And through them, they serve as a conduit for the reader to learn more about the Mandalorian culture and language. This book also gives insight into the variation of classes of clone troopers, and explains the difference between regular clone troopers, clone commandos, and arc troopers, something that I find lacking in other novels and comics from this and subsequent eras. Last but not least, we get to explore more of the character of Bardan Yusik, a Jedi Padawan who, with his compatriot, Etain Termukin, works closely with the Republic Special Operations Brigade, and we get to watch his camaraderie with the clones evolve to the point where he even starts becoming disillusioned with the Jedi Order, and starts thinking of himself as more of a Mandalorian than anything, as he becomes attracted to the culture much in the same way as I and other readers did while reading. Aside from a few questionable decisions certain characters make in this novel, I thoroughly enjoy Triple Zero, and I highly recommend the Republic Commando series in its entirety to anyone who wants to learn more about the Mandalorian culture, clone troopers, or how the Grand Army of the Republic was formed and trained. In fact, in the description I have linked a YouTube channel that is creating a fan-made Republic Commando audiobook, and they have already finished Hard Contact and are on the first chapter of Triple Zero, so check that out if you're interested. Number two on my list technically isn't 100% Expanded Universe, as it's a film novelization. I'm talking, of course, about Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith by Matthew Stover. Working from George Lucas's script, Matthew Stover wrote the novelization before the film was even finished, and it was published a full month before the release of the film. So naturally, it contains scenes that were deleted from the film upon release, and also slightly different dialogue. However, it is by no means inferior. Admittedly, my first exposure to the novelization was not a positive one, as when the PG-13 Revenge of the Sith came to theaters, my father did not allow 10-year-old me to go see it with my friends, and my mother, who felt bad for me, bought me the novelization as a gift, which I reluctantly read the first few chapters of before tossing it aside, as I was frustrated that I couldn't see the actual movie. However, upon picking up the novel again in my teens, I absolutely fell in love with it, and I still maintain to this day that I prefer it to the actual film. It's so much more than just a film novelization, because there's so many references to other EU material that it makes it feel as if the entirety of the novel is this massive culmination of all the film trilogies and all eras of the expanded universe, and that they're converging into one important point, and it feels truly powerful. Each chapter is from a different character's point of view, and the author does an immaculate job of capturing each character's essence. For example, when you're reading from Count Dooku's point of view, he's pompous and overconfident, and it's really interesting to read what he thinks his part in this war is and his future role in Palpatine's new empire. The most important facets of the story come from Anakin's point of view, and the reason why I find the novel to be better than the film is because, given these insights into what's going on through Anakin's mind as these events are happening to him, you get more of a justification as to why he fell to the dark side, when the film just portrays him as selfish and power-hungry. Case in point, in the novel, the whole reason why Anakin is striving to become a Jedi Master is because he'll gain access to the higher levels of the Jedi Archives, which include Sith Holocrons, where he feels he'll be able to find the secret to saving Padme, and he has his friend Palpatine get him onto the Jedi Council, and when Mace Windu tells him, yeah, you can have a council seat, but you're not a Jedi Master, he's actually justified in his outburst. The film, on the contrary, just shows him as being upset when he isn't granted a master's rank without this prior context, and all it does is a disservice to Anakin's character, and makes him look like a selfish punk that wants more than he deserves. 
In the novel, apart from his nightmares of Padme's death, Anakin is also tortured by his experiences in the Clone Wars, and the novel constantly references his thoughts on Jabim, Argonar, Munalinst, etc., where he saw so many of his fellow Jedi get gunned down, and it's these little references to the Clone Wars multimedia project that I appreciate so much, because it brings all of the books and comics that I've read beforehand together. If your favorite Star Wars movie is Revenge of the Sith, I implore you to give the novel a try, and I promise that you'll love it as much, if not more, than the actual film. It's really that great. Last but not least, number one on my top 10 favorite Star Wars Expanded Universe novel list is yet another James Luceno book, Star Wars Labyrinth of Evil. Labyrinth of Evil was published in 2005 as the last novel installment in the Clone Wars multimedia project, and is a direct lead-in to Star Wars Episode III, Revenge of the Sith. You've heard me talk about it a bit in this video, but for those who don't know, the Clone Wars multimedia project was a collective effort by Lucasfilm to populate the previously unexplored Clone Wars era with a highly interconnected series of novels, games, comics, and the Clone Wars miniseries that chronicled the events of the war while we all eagerly awaited the release of Revenge of the Sith. Labyrinth of Evil follows Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker, who, during the siege of Kato Naimoidia, recover Newt Gunray's Mechno Chair and discover not only that it can intercept highly encrypted transmissions from General Grievous, but also found past transmissions from the elusive Darth Sidious, which confirms everything Count Dooku told Obi-Wan in Attack of the Clones. They use the encryptions to catch Grievous off guard at Belderone, and following this, Anakin and Obi-Wan track down the beings who made, designed, and transported the components of the Mechno Chair in an effort to learn more about Sidious. Meanwhile, Mace Windu leads a team of Arcs and Commandos into the catacombs of the Works District on Coruscant to try and find Sidious. Before Anakin and Obi-Wan can get to the bottom of it, they are sent to the Tithe system after evidence of Dooku's presence is discovered there, and Mace Windu's search is interrupted by Grievous' invasion of Coruscant, and the rest of the novel is them dealing with those situations accordingly. I love Labyrinth of Evil because it's this great culmination of all of my favorite pieces of Star Wars media from the Clone Wars Multimedia Project, and with numerous references to the events of the other comics, novels, and miniseries, it really feels like you've been fighting in this massive war for years, but you can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel as you reflect on all of your hardships. The unfortunate thing about Labyrinth of Evil, however, is that there are some discrepancies between it and the Clone Wars miniseries, specifically regarding the Battle of Coruscant and the Battle of Tithe. However, they're so easily reconcilable that it's not even really an issue. In Clone Wars Volume 2, Palpatine tells Anakin and Obi-Wan to go to Nelvon to investigate sightings of General Grievous, and though they don't find him there, Anakin goes on a soul-searching journey and finds a techno-union lab experimenting on the natives, which he promptly destroys and saves them. While in Labyrinth of Evil, Sidious, sensing that the Jedi are close to discovering his true identity, tells Grievous to send a diversionary fleet to attack the Tithe system, and Obi-Wan and Anakin are interrupted from their investigation to lead the liberation of Tithe, where they find out that Dooku is there, but he flees the planet before they can intercept him. The easiest way to reconcile the two is just have the events on Nelvan take place before the events of Tithe, and as for Coruscant, though certain characters are doing slightly different tasks than they are in the miniseries, the important thing is all of the characters who should have been on Coruscant are on the correct planet at the correct time, which is good enough for me. Even some of the secondary characters from the miniseries are there, such as Val Mudana and Roran Karab. So, the effort for interconnectivity between the book and the show was made, which is more than could be said for later Clone Wars works, but I'm not going to get into that. Despite this hiccup, Labyrinth of Evil is still a fantastic read, and I would even go as far as to say that it's required reading if you're going to read the novelization for Revenge of the Sith, especially if you wish to know why Obi-Wan thinks that business on Kato Naimoidia doesn't count. There you have it. Those are my top 10 favorite Star Wars Expanded Universe novels. Tell me what your favorite Star Wars novels are in the comments. And if you're unfamiliar with the Star Wars Expanded Universe, check out my channel. And if you like what you see, why not subscribe?
I just want to take a second to express my sincerest thanks to all of my subscribers, and everyone who's shared my videos. I couldn't have gotten to 7k subs without you. And to all who have left extremely encouraging comments on my videos, you guys are the reason why I keep going. Thank you so much. And of course, a very special thank you to all of my Patreon folks. Wildcat144, The Grand Pope, Zexend, JTribs1997, David Miller, AJ Can't Think of a Good Pun Right Now, Captain Chewbacca, Dave the Grave, Hugo Novotny, Zim the Despot, and Matt Patton. Your contributions are greatly appreciated, and I never thought I'd get to a point where there would be people who believed in me and loved what I do enough to generously donate. Thank you so much. If you're interested in supporting this channel, visit my Patreon page linked in the description, where you'll find an assortment of perks ranging from access to behind-the-scenes content and specialized Discord roles to being able to commission your own video that goes to the top of my priority list. Anyways, I've been Tad Larkin, you're watching Mandalore, and I'll see you next time.